I never liked Skyler. At the young and rebellious age of 19, he had a lean, tan body and muscled pecs atop his broad, freckled shoulders. He had dusty blonde hair, styled in the same fashion as surfers from old beach movies made in the 1960s. And he had a pretty, yet also smug face that could be mistaken for any heartthrob found on the cover of any magazine in the checkout aisle of any convenience store. <laughs> and then there was myself, at the same age as him, maybe a month or two younger, a porky, dark-haired misfit. I was the friend who consoled the girls dumped by guys like him. <laughs> if knowing that pretty girls were attracted to Skylar's hazel eyes and pouty lips wasn't enough to torment my post-pubescent ego, it was seeing visual proof on the screen of his computer. After spending an entire evening splitting a bottle of whiskey and smoking weed, Skylar decided to share all of his past sexual encounters with me and my friend Ethan. This entailed many graphic stories and endless streams of digital photos involving his ongoing long-distance girlfriends. The earliest pictures were typical. First dates, long car drives, and nature hikes, but towards the end, all of these girls would be standing in the most provocative posture, facing his camera with their long, dreamy stares, exposing their breasts, and digging their jeweled hands into their tangled hair. While growing up, I always believed that I would eventually lose my baby fat, come out from my shell, and become the charming stud that was shown to me through modern entertainment. <laughs> Unfortunately, that was not the case. I was still overweight and unhappy, but Skylar, he hadn't changed at all. He had always had it easy. So when he said, I have some videos saved, but they're on my external hard drive back at home, I cringed. <laughs> Puffing on the end of a joint, he added, some of these girls will do anything if I ask them to. <laughs> Embarrassed, I stepped out from his apartment and had myself a smoke. At that particular moment of my life, I had come to rely on Skylar because he was providing me a floor to sleep on. Only two months prior, Ethan and I drove across the country to San Diego. We were tired of the slow New England lifestyle and needed a change of pace. It wasn't until after we lived in the front seats of his Hyundai Elantra for a few weeks that we crossed paths with Skylar. Similar to our situation, he had fled from his own boring life in Minnesota, but lucky for him, he had his grandfather who agreed to give him money in exchange for making an effort to find a job. <laughs> uh, I'll look for work next week, Skylar would always tell us. When we asked him about what his grandfather would say, he'd shake his head and laugh. That old man is going senile. Don't worry, I can always count on him or my girlfriends, they could always help me out. I did feel ashamed when thinking about Skylar's swindled grandfather and the copious girls he was scamming, but I also wanted a better place to sleep than inside a cramped vehicle stuffed to the brim with junk. All that I could think to do was to stay put until Ethan and I saved enough money necessary to get a place of our own. Living in that car together had taught us a few things about life and each other. When announcing our departure to our friends, they all seemed shocked by our sudden decision. They didn't understand that we saw little to no opportunities in New Hampshire, and they couldn't believe that Ethan and I were willing to risk our lives to embark on such a quest. But what will you do if your car breaks down on the way, they asked. The only answer we had was to just smile and say, then that's where we'll bust out the welcome mat and call home. During that time, we were sleeping so close, so close together that we may as well have been sharing a bed. We came to think of each other as brothers. We looked up to each other. I believed that he could transform me from the pudgy pessimist I was and into a desirable hunk. Although tall and handsome, Ethan had an awkward quirk about him. His orangutan arms and slim, narrow torso made him resemble a stick figure man. <laughs> Whenever he got excited, his limbs would like flail about in every direction. Getting him riled up could sometimes be dangerous. If one wasn't paying enough attention, he'd get a fist in the eye. Over time, I grew protective over him. We had, a, we had established a friendship that thrived off our, of our reliance on one another. It was more than finances. We had a sacred trust. The only threat against our synergy was that of an outsider, Skylar. <laughs> Ever since the first night we met him, I knew that Skylar couldn't be trusted. A week before signing the lease to his apartment, we saw him sitting in the driver's seat to his parked silver Chevy. His feet were planted on the black pavement of Garnett Street and his head, covered in a thin layer of salt and sand from the nearby beach, was bent low and glum. Looking through his rolled-down windows, 
I recognize the similar Tetris strategy used in our own car in regards to the abundant amount of boxes and clothes organized in the back seat. We introduced each other, told each other our life stories, why San Diego, how long we've been here, what we were planning to do in the near future about a living situation. I've got a couple of bottles of vodka in the trunk, Skylar said. Want to mix it with some Gatorade and go for a walk on the beach? <laughs> Shrugging, we accepted. This was the first person we met in San Diego who we could call a friend. Although I was not much of a drinker, I couldn't risk not looking cool. Ethan and I followed Skylar along the sandy coast of Pacific Beach, sipping our bottles and watching girls. It almost felt like heaven, but then everything seemed to fall apart. Watching Skylar and Ethan approach girls, flaunting their muscles and flexing their smiles, I felt my stomach tighten. Why was it so easy for them? Drinking to the point of feeling tipsy, I started having trouble keeping up with Ethan and our newly acquainted friend. Tossing the bottle in the trash, I put all my focus into not losing them. They were already far ahead, beyond the beach and intermingled with pedestrian traffic. I watched as they walked further down the street, away from my sight and towards the main strip. I know a place where we can go, Skylar said as I caught up to the two of them. He looked through me, pretending as if I didn't exist, and motioning for Ethan to follow him through the herds of tourists, past the bars, and into a hostel. Inside, people congregated on its patio deck. Placed at the center was a barbecue pit. Help yourselves, the chef said from behind a parade of smoke. Ethan and, I or Ethan and Skylar walked up to the condiment bar and dressed their buns. Not at all tempted by the food, I instead dealt with the oncoming spins whirling within my head. I was no longer relaxing in paradise, but instead enduring a tropical hurricane of intoxication. <laughs> Clenching my eyes shut, I focused on calming the storm, on not embarrassing myself by vomiting all over the place, on cursing Skylar for dragging me into this mess, and on hating myself for being so stupid into thinking I could ever be like him. Before I knew it, I passed out. It wasn't until one of the hostile employees woke me up that I remembered what happened. We can call you a cab, man, but you can't stay here. Where are my friends, I asked from behind closed eyes. I felt as if I were alone on a rowboat, endlessly rocking with the off-tempo tide. The two younger guys? They left hours ago, man. Do you need us to call you a cab or the cops? I, I didn't know what to say. Do I tell them the truth and say that I don't have a home to go to? That my home was a four-door Hyundai that was packed to its fullest capacity with my best friend's belongings? That all I had with me was a backpack stuffed with only two changes of clothes? that I'm practically on the verge of homelessness. I had nowhere to go, no money. Everything was Ethan's. It was still dark out when I left the hostel, but the streetlights and flashing bar signs of PB's main strip helped guide me back through its gridded maze. I found Ethan's car wedged between two U-Haul moving vans. Its two front seats were reclined as far back as the boxes in the back seat allowed. Peering in through that window, I could see two figures sleeping inside, and just one night I had been replaced. Hey, Skylar, wake up! Knocking on the glass, I watched him stir awake. We locked eyes, but only for a moment, before he rolled over and turned his back to me. I despised him for treating me like this, like I was nothing, and I hated myself for not having the courage to do something about it. Declaring defeat, with my tail tucked between my legs, I forfeited the car and slept on the beach. My relationship with Skylar from that moment on got progressively worse. After seeing a picture of my cousin, who he found to be very attractive, he taunt me by saying, I hope I get to meet your cousin soon. I just can't wait the fucker. Even Ethan joined in after a while. We're only joking, he said, when Skylar wasn't around. I could tell that he was being sincere, but Skylar? Dealing with Skylar and his bullshit lasted for only a few more weeks. It wasn't until Ethan's sister Camille visited that he finally caught on to Skylar's act. Similar to Ethan, Camille was tall and dark-haired with long legs and elegant arms. She had big eyes, a flashy smile, and was older than us by a few years. Like Ethan and I, she slept on Skylar's living room floor. During the days while we looked for jobs, she cleaned up the mountains of empty Bud Light cans and mopped up the splatters crusted over from the previous night's spilt beer. By the time we got back from our own endeavors, she would have the fridge fully restocked. One day, when we came home from work, we found a half-naked Camille passed out on the floor and a drunk Skylar groping her. Ethan pulled him off of her, leading to a shoving match, and at the end of their fight, Skylar ordered us to pack up our shit and get the fuck out of his house. It had been years since I thought about Skylar. 
We did as he wished that day, leaving his apartment and staying at a hotel until Camille flew back east. By the time she left, Ethan and I found steady jobs and saved enough money to get our home. With baby steps, we were able to spoil ourselves with unnecessary commodities such as basic cable television, a pantry filled with snacks, and a laptop computer connected to the neighbor's wireless internet. <laughs> Late at night, I lurked within the web page labyrinths of social media such as Facebook or MySpace. I was always interested to see what was going on in other people's lives. Who has kids? Who has a good job? Who loves their life? Who hates theirs? Who's miserable? And then, just like that, Skylar's name popped into my head. Typing his name inside the search engine box, I fantasized about discovering him living a life of depression. <laughs> At the top left corner of his page was a close-up portrait, projecting his unforgettable leer. What a pretentious prick. Skylar had never changed. He was the same pompous ass I met in Pacific Beach. But then I read, R.I.P. Skylar. Trickling below the comment were dozens of other farewell notes, all of them wishing Skylar a peaceful rest. A majority of them were the faces of his lovers. I skimmed past their profile pictures, counting the grieving posts with my eyes. A hyperlink followed by a statement read, to all friends and family of Skylar, we are sad to share this news, and we thank you all for thinking of us during this hard time. Please call us if you wish to attend Skylar's services. Signed at the bottom and typed next to a long distance phone number was the name of Skylar's grandfather. Anxious and also curious, I clicked the link. Roseville man dies after falling off from cliff. Skylar and a few of his friends had trespassed into a state park late at night after its operating hours. While there, they passed warning signs and safety fences, partying, drinking, and enjoying the invulnerability of being young. Sitting in my seat, I played the news story in my head over and over. His friends told the police that he was sitting a little too close to the slope's edge. We told him that people fall off the cliffs all the time, but he wouldn't listen. Skylar was someone you couldn't tell what to do. He was just too free. The medics didn't reach him at the cliff's base until hours later. His body was lost, mangled underneath gigantic boulders and overgrown bushes. He didn't live for much longer, dying only minutes after arriving to the hospital's gates. From what I could make from this article, it sounded like he suffered a lot.